Order, please. We'll call the meeting of the Public Accounts Committee to order. First of all, I want to say welcome back to everyone. It's been six months since we've been together as a committee, and today it finally happened. So, uh, just a few reminders before we begin to uh, place your phones on silent or vibrate, and we'll ask the committee members to start introducing themselves. Ms. Chender. Good morning, Claudia Chender, MLA, Dartmouth South. Good morning, Tim Hallman, MLA, Dartmouth East. Good morning, Suzanne Lonescroft, Lunenburg, and Vice Chair. Good morning, nice to be back. I'm Margaret Miller, the MLA for Hans East. I'm the MLA for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, Ben Jessam. Good morning all, Rafa DiCostanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good morning, Brenda McGuire, MLA, Halifax Atlantic. Good morning, Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Thank you. Now, uh, just a few uh, guidelines that we have to follow with the COVID-19 around, but uh, please keep your mask on during the meeting unless you are speaking. You'll notice I won't have mine on most of the time in order to help the back and forth go. Modern water is available to everyone. And in an effort to limit movement within the chamber, we ask you to remain in your seat as much as possible. So in order to accommodate this, we'll take a short break around the one hour mark uh, in the meeting and I'd ask for agreement to extend the length of the meeting by an additional 15 minutes, if that's okay. It provides uh, all committee members the opportunity to ask their questions. Are we agreed? Okay, thank you. And lastly, when leaving the chamber, Please use the side exits and re-enter the chamber via the main doors, okay? So I think that, that's pretty much it. So on today's agenda, we have officials from the Office of the Auditor General with us to discuss the May 2020 report of the Auditor General, follow-up of 2015, 16, and 17. So I'm going to ask the witnesses to introduce themselves, please. Terry Spicer, Acting Auditor General. Good morning, I'm Andrew Atherton, Assistant Auditor General. Good morning, Adam Harding, Senior Audit Principal. Great, thank you. And also we have uh, staff from the Clerk's Office, uh, Ledge Council, Ledge TV, and Ledge TV is up there, which is a different situation this time. So. Uh, we'll begin then, we'll ask the witness to make their opening remarks. Mr. Spicer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to the committee members. With me today is Mr. Andrew Atherton. He's the Assistant Auditor General who leads our performance audit practice, and Mr. Adam Harding, who is the Senior Principal on the Performance Audit Team and the Project Lead for the follow-up report we will be discussing today. Before I provide some brief comments on the highlights of our report, I would like to take the time to acknowledge the hard work and professionalism of our team at the office. Throughout the last several months, and notwithstanding the complications of working remotely, we have been able to be, continue to be productive and effective. As an example, we've issued three performance audit reports and completed several financial statement audits, including the public accounts of Nova Scotia. It is also important to recognize and thank the many civil servants who work with us during these difficult times to enable us to continue working to fulfill the mission and mandate of the office. So in May of 2020, we tabled our follow-up report in which we assessed the implementation status of performance audit recommendations from calendar years 2015, 2016, and 2017. It's important to note that our conclusions in the report are based on a point in time, October 18th, 2019. So in other words, that was the status of the recommendations at that day. Due to COVID-19 related implications, complications, our original release date was pushed back to the middle of May. Where it is now September 2020, a fair bit of time has passed, and unfortunately we're not able to provide comments on implementation activity during that time or the impact that COVID-19 may have had on the implementation plans to address those recommendations. 
Questions related to those issues, the responsible entities will need to respond to those questions. This year, we made some enhancements to our report based on the feedback from the Public Accounts Committee. First, we have extended our follow-up on recommendations from 2015 for one additional year. And also, you will notice that Appendix 4 includes management prepared summaries of what actions organizations have taken or plan to take to address all not complete recommendations from 2015, 2016, and 2017. Finally, Appendix 5 provides a similar summary for actions taken on planned or planned for our 2018 recommendations, which should help you give an early indication of the implementation status of those recommendations. It's important to note that beyond a very high level reasonability assessment, we do not provide any level of assurance on management's comments. Turning to our key findings in the report, Government completed 93% of the 69 recommendations we made in 2015, with only five recommendations yet to be completed. For recommendations made in 2016, 70% of the 43 recommendations have been implemented. There are five audits with lower overall completion rates related to homes, and they relate to homes for special care, species at risk, licensed child care, school capital planning, and critical infrastructure resiliency. These audits have a big impact on the overall completion rate for 2016. For recommendations made in 2017, 81% of the 47 recommendations were completed, which is a very really good start. Chapters 2, 3, and 4 of our report highlight the recommendations which are not yet complete, including the risks which remain by not completing the recommendations. I would like to thank the committee for the continued interest in our work and hope the increased information included in this report will assist you in fulfilling your role as a member of the Public Accounts Committee. And now I would be happy to answer any questions about the report that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Spicer. So we'll open the, uh, the floor for the first round of questionings. Uh, it'll be 20 minutes for each caucus. And uh, probably after the 20 minute round, that might be an ideal opportunity for us to take our 15 minute break. So with that, uh, Mr. Hallman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's very nice to be back uh, in uh, the Public Accounts Committee. Welcome, Mr. Spicer, Mr. Atherton, and Mr. Harding. Uh, thank you to uh, your, the staff at the Office of Auditor General for their ongoing oversight, their ongoing work uh, uh, to, to hold government accountable and to point out areas in which uh, public policy and, uh, and expenditures need to, uh, need to improve. Uh, the May 2020 report, this is a comprehensive, a very comprehensive follow-up. And the OAG has described the follow-up for 2016 uh, as disappointing with uh, a third of the recommendations not complete. Could you outline for Nova Scotians um, you know, what risks remain, specifically as it pertains to the, the report uh, of 20, in, uh, about 2016? Mr. Spicer. I'll pass that to, to Mr. Harding. Mr. Harding. As you can appreciate, we have a, a lot of information here today to uh, be prepared for public accounts. Um, so in terms of the recommendations from 2016 and the risks that remain, uh, we highlight a lot of those risks throughout uh, our report. So you'll find that in Chapter 3. Um, there are several chapters that have higher, uh, they have lower overall completion rates. Um, so homes for special care, species at risk. Um, licensed child care, school capital planning, and critical infrastructure resiliency. Um, throughout the report, we highlight some of the specific risks that remain because these recommendations are not yet complete. So if we take, for example, um, let's look at species at risk. So on page 22 of our report, we highlight that there are four recommendations which remain not complete from this 2016 audit. 
Um, some of those particular recommendations include that the department hasn't established recovery teams and developed and reviewed recovery and management plans for species at risk as required by the Endangered Species Act. Um, the department hasn't reviewed all species listed in the endangered species regulations to amend or develop appropriate practices as guided by recovery teams to protect their habitat. The department hasn't yet completed the recommendation to create a comprehensive monitoring program for all species at risk and ensure that monitoring activities are clearly communicated and completed. And the department has not yet completed the recommendation to establish detailed action plans with measurable outcomes to implement its biodiversity strategy. Uh, as part of that plan should specify what needs to be done, when, and the ex expected results. So all of these recommendations from this particular chapter really create a risk that by not completing them, endangered species are not being properly monitored or properly conserved. Um, this, is an area, this is a particular chapter where we would, would encourage the department to continue its work towards completing these recommendations. Now in Appendix 4 of our report, we uh, provide more information or the summaries that management has prepared in terms of these recommendations and the actions that they're taken. Um, I won't read what's in Appendix 4 to you for these, these recommendations, but they highlight some of the actions that the department has indicated, including how they're working on establishing recovery teams, how they're working on refreshing uh, management plans and special management practices. So that information should help the committee in terms of holding government accountable around the actions the department has indicated. And further to that, the department has also indicated, where applicable, some timelines of the work that they're doing or they plan to do, uh, which may also further assist this committee. Mr. Helm. So when you do the follow-up, do departments, or in this particular case, specifically with the 2016 follow-up, do departments indicate to you how they will complete the outstanding promises? Do they, do they provide an outline of a process in which they will follow to, to complete those outstanding uh, commitments? Mr. Spicer. So, yeah, so, so part of the process, and, and again this year, we, we've, uh, we've requested that management provide us with uh, some comments on, on how they intend to complete the, the outstanding recommendations. So, so as I, as, and, uh, we don't audit those particular summaries. They're provided for information purposes only, and, but they're in the report, and um, um, they're there for, for the committee to look at. And, and again, this, this would be a great opportunity um, when the committee brings the departments in is to explore those, those comments and the details around those further with them. Mr. Hobb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'd like to turn our attention to 2017 of the follow-up, uh, specifically uh, mental health. And um, obviously, uh, with, with everything that has transpired in the last few months, uh, I know we'd all agree that, that mental health and uh, access to our mental health services, enhancing our mental health services are, are critical uh, in the COVID-19 era. Um, my concern, that when I read the follow-up report, my concern is that government is not uh, adequately prepared to fill the gaps uh, in the mental health system, which the, the audit uh, certainly highlights, especially with respect to, to, to wait times. So let me ask you this, uh, overall, does the Office of Auditor General feel that the government is prepared to fill the gaps uh, in the mental health system? Mr. Spicer. Well, uh, that's a very difficult uh, uh, question to answer from, for, uh, because it's, a, it's extremely broad. I think we can speak to, we can only speak to the recommendations that, that are there in the audit that we did. And um, of course, we you know any time that that recommendations are not completed, gaps and risks exist and continue to exist. And so, uh, so to the extent that those recommendations are not complete, then yes, I would say there are gaps and risks that that still need to be addressed. But uh, you know that that's that's the that's the the breadth of what we're we're able to speak to there. Mr. Palmer, in the course of your follow up. Um, what did you discover about service delivery plans? First of all, what are service delivery plans and uh, what did the office discover in terms of, I guess, the implementation of these, thing, of these plans? Mr. Spicer? I said to, uh, to Adam or Andrew. Mr. Harding. Uh, Mr. Mr. Harding. 
Are you able to speak to service WP in more detail or just a general? So in general, a service delivery plan would really just outline uh, the services that you have and how you're planning on delivering them. So it's, it's really what it sounds like. Um, so we were recommending that the Nova Scotia Health Authority ensure that funding to, to programs and services is allocated based on their service delivery plans. And that should include accountability requirements uh, for performance of the funded programs and services. Now, when we originally did this audit in 2017, what we found and what we highlighted in our report was there was concerns that funding was generally based on the prior year's budget um, and necessary adjust uh, adjustments were made if required. Um, really, this wasn't an effective approach to budgeting that really effective service delivery plans would ensure the funding is clearly linked to the programs and services that management is accountable for and for the performance of those particular programs. All of this creating a risk that funding to programs and services may not be based on those plans. Um, in Appendix 4 on page 59 of the report, the uh, Health Authority provides their summary of some of the actions that they've taken, or that the, they indicate that they've taken, including engaging in a process for setting the program directions for the next five years, and that as a final step of that process uh, will include KPIs, so key performance indicators for accountability and performance tra tracking. At the time they provided the summary, they indicated that they expect to complete uh, their work around this particular recommendation in the spring of 2020. Mr. Holm. And for Nova Scotians, can you clarify who determines the standard wait times? Is it Department of Health and Wellness or is it uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority? Mr. Hardy? I'm going strictly off of, of memory uh, from that audit. Um, I believe that the actual standards, I believe, are nationally developed. Um, so it would be either uh, a national standard through Kai High, uh, I believe it's Canadian Institute for Health Information, um, but there would be standards that would be published on the department's website that would indicate both the source of the wait time standard uh, and the department's progress against those standards. Mr. Hammond. So am I correct to say that in the course of your audit and subsequent follow-up that it wasn't clear as to the scope of who is responsible to ensure those standards? Is it Department of Health or is it Nova Scotia Health Authority? Mr. Hurdy? So in terms of the original audit, I can't recall the specific details around the wait times as to uh, what all we had identified in terms of concerns around them. Um, but that being said, it's the responsibility of the health authority to report, uh, to collect the wait time data. They would then take that information and report it to the Department of Health and Wellness, who is responsible for posting that information on the departmental website and making it available to all Nova Scotians. Mr. Hallman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So historically in Nova Scotia, uh, the wait time standards were set uh, to be reasonably close to the actual wait time in the system. Uh, thereby making, making it easier for the system to meet them. So the question is, have wait time standards been developed by Department of Health uh, or NSHA since the report of last October notes they haven't been? Could you provide us some clarity on that? Mr. Spicer. So, uh, so the process that we do for, for this, just to, to remind the committee, um, so all of the recommendations that management says are complete, we will go out and validate those to ensure they're complete. If, the, if uh, management says the recommendation is not complete, then uh, we essentially use that as a management uh, um, a statement and we don't go out and validate that. So, so if it wasn't complete as at October uh, 2019, um, then we would not have done any additional work to be able to determine whether what activity has been done to that to bring us up to today. So um, again, I would that that would be a great question for the Department of Health. To, you know, when you bring them in to talk about the the results of of the of the of these audits and recommendations, but we don't know what's been done since October uh, uh, 2019. Mr. Hammond. Uh, to your point of, of validating, how you go about validating whether or not a recommendation is being implemented, can you explain uh, the process, the internal process you have to, to validate? Um, could you uh, tell Nova Scotians about that, what process you have? Mr. Spicer. And I'll pass that to Mr. Harding. Mr. Harding. 
Thank you. Um, as an auditor, that's always a, a very good question, one we certainly enjoy answering, is explaining our work and, and how we do our work. Um, in terms of validating a, a recommendation, so every year we let government know the date that we'll be doing the download from the system that we use to compile all of the statuses. Um, so government would go through their own process, which I wouldn't be able to speak to. Um, ultimately, we get a download which indicates whether recommendations have been self-assessed as complete or not complete by the different departments or organizations that are covered by that year's follow-up engagement. Um, once we have those individual recommendations, for the complete recommendations, what we'll do is we'll review what the department is, is saying that they've done. So in that system, it will indicate, for example, uh, any key documents, key staff that maybe were involved in a process. Uh, it might indicate, for example, a summary of what they've done. Um, so when we're looking to validate, we're starting with that information plus the original audit report. That's usually the, the, one of the other things that we always do is go back to the original report and look to see what were the issues that led to the recommendation and also what did the department say that they were going to do when we did the original audit. So with all of that information together, we will then compile a list of questions for the different organizations looking for evidence uh, and support of what they've said. So for example, if they indicated that they had developed a policy, we would ask them to provide us with a copy of that policy. Um, if they said that they've developed a process or they've had meetings or they've done something, we'd be looking for evidence that would support that they have completed those particular actions. Um, the level of work that we do for our follow-up engagement is a little bit different than a performance audit. Really all that means is that we don't do quite the same extent of work to follow up, so we're not testing as many sample items, we're not doing the same degree of, of work, but ultimately we're still expressing a conclusion that the status of these recommendations, the status of complete recommendations, is the way that it's being presented in our report. So at the end of the day, if, if we're saying it's complete, that the department is, is saying it's complete, we've done our work, we agree that it is complete. Mr. Hum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so focusing again on the report, um, recommendation 2.2, uh, Mr. Harding, is marked as completed which means there is now, uh, quote, well-defined evidence-based model of care for mental health services, including an evaluation process, end quote. Uh, I'm curious as to what uh, the Office of Auditor General discovered in terms of a model. Um, what is the evidence for its effectiveness for the Office of Auditor General to make that statement? Mr. Hardy. So in terms of that recommendation, um, I don't have all the details of this specific model or that the department would be able, uh, sorry, the Nova Scotia Health Authority in this case would be better able to provide more details about this specific model and the rationale for selecting it. But at a very high level, the, uh, a provincial model was developed or was implemented um, related to the model of care for mental health services. Uh, as part of that, objectives and strategies had also, uh, also had uh, desired deliverables and outcomes to evaluate that model. So. In the information that we were provided and that we examined to validate this recommendation, what we would have saw is that a model had been implemented and that it included um, some of these key things such as objectives and strategies that would allow that um, evaluation of, of the model itself to take place. But again, the Department or the Health Authority would be better able to provide more details about the specific rationale and why they implemented the model that they did if that's what you're looking for. Mr. Hama. And for purposes of clarity, again, going back to the question I've already asked, um, primarily, is it Department of Health or Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, that I should be asking these questions? Because I'm getting the sense it's tossed back and forth uh, a lot of these, these issues. Could you, based on your audit, could you clarify as to the best source uh, to get information on wait times for, uh, for uh, our mental health system? Mr. Hardy. Uh, in regards to recommendation 2.2 specifically, that would be to the Nova Scotia Health Authority. They would be the ones that would be best able to speak to that recommendation. Uh, generally, as a guide in our report, if we indicate who is, um, by indicating who's responsible for a recommendation, so in this case, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, we're assessing it as complete, it would be based on work that we did and information we obtained from the Nova Scotia Health Authority. The Department of Health and Wellness may have a role in part of that, but primary, uh, primary responsibility for that recommendation would rest with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Mr. Hobbin with about three minutes left. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Harding, overall, in the course of the audit, in the course of the follow-up, did you find, did you discover 
uh, whether it was just you know based on observation or just anecdotes you heard, uh, that there was. Uh, I guess a, a diffusion of responsibility, so to speak, uh, between Department of Health and Nova Scotia Health Authority as it pertain, pertains to our, our mental health system? Or did you find that, no, there was a, a clarity as to the scope of responsibilities, uh, say, related to wait times? Mr. Hardy. Um, from a broad sense, I'm not able to answer that. So we didn't specifically look to see the roles and responsibilities across mental health services and as it relates to both organizations. As it relates to these recommendations, we were looking to see whether responsibility for the recommendations rested with uh, the correct organization, so whether it was with the Nova Scotia Health Authority or the Department of Health and Wellness. And in terms of the recommendations that we assess as complete, I'd be able to say that the responsibilities for those recommendations uh, were clear in terms of we were able to get the information that we were looking for from those organizations. But I wouldn't be able to make any comments from the broader system perspective based on the work that we did for this project. Mr. Harmon, two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, okay, since, since this has been in place since October of 2019, uh, I'm curious, um, you know, in the audit and the follow-up, what data and methodology did you, did you see in terms of uh, uh, an attempt to reduce the wait times uh, for, for those that need access to this service? Were you given access to data and the methodology used uh, to improve uh, the, uh, the wait times? Mr. Ather. Um, for this project, we're focused on the recommendations that we've made. So there's not a recommendation here specific to reducing the wait times. We're looking to define the wait times and report those. I believe that's recommendation 2.3, which is made to all three organizations, the department, the health authority, and the IWK. So we wouldn't have been looking for any data around reduction of wait times specific to these recommendations. When we're doing our follow-up work is very narrow. It's very focused on just what we've asked them to do, what have you done, and then we look to assess the reasonability of that. So we wouldn't have gone any broader than that. Okay, Mr. Harmon, you, if you can get one in one minute. <laughs> so it's correct to say then you did not get access to data uh, or information regarding additional, uh, regarding wait times. You weren't granted access to that information. Is that a correct statement? Mr. Rather. We wouldn't have sought access to that. So it's not an issue of whether we were granted. If we, had, if we needed to get access to that, we would be given access to that. But in this instance, it's not something that was necessary to do this audit or this report. Thank you. The time for the PC caucus for the first round is up. So we'll go to the NDP caucus for 20 minutes. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everybody. I'm going to uh, start right in with some, uh, some questions about some of the recommendations that were not uh, complete. And the first, uh, first thing I want to ask about is homes for special care. So homes for special care overseen by the Department of Health and Wellness include long-term care and residential care facilities. In 2016, your office recommended the department establish clear responsibilities and accountability for service provider performance and reporting requirements to ensure activities are carried out. This recommendation has not been completed. The May, two, uh, May 2020 report, follow-up report, excuse me, states that, quote, by not completing this recommendation, there is a risk that health and wellness may not be adequately monitoring and managing homes for special care, end quote. So my first question is, if not completing this recommendation creates the risk that health and wellness may not be adequately monitoring and managing homes for, for special care, uh, isn't this a significant concern in terms of dealing with a pandemic like COVID-19? Mr. Spicer? I, I think, uh, again, um, certainly through in, in a pandemic, the, the uh, you know, the, the issues around monitoring and making sure what's happening at, at these facilities, uh, I guess, gets magnified. And so, uh, you know, it, it is a, um, you know, it was, it was an important recommendation and, um, you know, and, and we, you know, it, 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 it's, it's valid today and probably as much as it ever was. So, uh, so, so I guess yeah, pandemics tend to magnify these types of, these types of recommendations. And so, yes, it's, uh, you know, it, it's certainly, uh, 
it's certainly extremely important and extremely, uh, you know, uh, relevant today. And is it possible then that the absence of, the cl of clear responsibilities and accountability for service provider performance and reporting may have contributed to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak that we saw in long-term care facilities? Mr. Spicer. So that would be, we would not be able to comment on that. Again, I, I think you'd need to get management in and, and uh, have it, uh, you know, talk to them about that. Uh, I, you know, when we make those recommendations, we look at the risks of, of what would be the risks of not doing this and, uh, and the risks we've laid out there. So, um, you know, that, that again would, would definitely be a question that you'd need to talk to management about because we haven't done additional audit work no. related to, to the consequences. So. Ms. LeBlanc. So according to a response that our caucus received to a freedom of information request, the government doesn't have or collect any data on the number of residents in multiple occupancy rooms in long-term care facilities. Multiple occupancy rooms, as we all know, have been identified as a significant factor in the outbreak at Northwood and in the first wave of the pandemic. Would you categorize this lack of data as an example of the government not adequately monitoring and managing homes for special care? Is that part, is, is, is data collection part of that management? Mr. Spicer. Uh, it would really depend on, on what the contracts that, that they signed with the, with, the, uh, with the providers. I mean, the, the, the essence of our recommendation at that point in time was to better clarify what you expect uh, in, in some detailed, uh, you know, with, when you're with these service providers. So, so if part of that was uh, room uh, <coughs> individuals, how many people are in a room, then, um, then, then we would expect that there would be data and stuff to, to support that. So it really depends on, on what they sh how they structure those contracts. And we don't have that information now. We, we wouldn't be able to know what's in those contracts. Mr. Spicer. You'd, ha you'd have to ask management about that, yeah. Ms. LeBlanc. Are you able to provide any insight into why this recommendation was not completed uh, in the four years from the, point of, uh, from the point that this weakness was identified in the Department's management of health and safety risks in long-term care? Do you have any, have they, have they explained why the recommendation hasn't been completed? Mr. Spicer. Sorry. Um, we certainly have, have asked them and, and have included their response in the report and we can, we can go to that response if, if, if you wish. Ms. LeBlanc. I mean, uh, I think we can wait on that because we have access to it, yeah. Um, but I was just, I guess I was asking if you had any kind of, um, like, you know, overarching thoughts on that. Mr. Spicer. No overarching thoughts. And, and I guess just, again, uh, I mean, uh, it, just to be clear, I mean, we, um, it's extremely difficult for us to, to do audit level work on, on management's uh, uh, comments like that, right? So, so we really put them there for information purposes um, because, it, you know, we, we think it does provide some, some information to the, to the committee to, to, to look at. But really to get any, any type of depth and breadth of a, of a conversation about that, you would need to get management in. Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, in 2000, so I'm going to move on now to uh, the home care support contracts. Um, in 2017, your office recommended that the Department of Health and Wellness put a process in place to verify the accuracy of reporting from home support providers to ensure that the department has accurate information to use for decision making and that the department and the MSHA maintain an integrated record of home support complaints received, including their outcome. These recommendations have not been completed. The government's failure to adequately invest in long-term care has meant that they are very reliant on various home care providers to provide health care services to our aging population. Since these recommendations have not been completed, how can, confident are you that the department has accurate information to use to make decisions about increasing spending on home care contracts? Mr. Spicer. Uh, I don't know, Andrew or Adam, do you guys have any... Yeah. And we, I really don't have a lot of information to, to provide one way or the other on that. We know that we know the recommendation hasn't been completed, so the risks that are associated with that still exist. Um, whether that information is, is out there now uh, and that could be provided, uh, we don't know. So, 
again, uh, I hate to say the same things, but but really it is management that needs to come in and speak to to what information they have have available and what they can provide. Ms. LeBlanc. Without an integrated record of home support complaints, does the government have any mechanism for reporting on the quality of care being delivered through home care support contracts? Mr. Spicer. Do we have any information on that? Mr. Rather. I mean, as Mr. Spicer has alluded to, as I've said, we look specifically at the recommendations. So in this case, we're looking for an integrated record of home support complaints. Um, we didn't look at how that impacts the overall service delivery. Our focus is on the complaints and on the, the records. I'll try to peek around Tim here. Uh, so we're looking to see how well those complaints are recorded so we can see how those have been addressed. I can't take that to how that impacts service overall. That's, that's three steps beyond what we were looking at here. We'd, you'd need to bring in the, the department and the health authority to ask them to take it beyond there. Our work is very narrow when it comes to follow-up. When we do a performance audit, we go a little bit broader. But when it comes to our follow-up work, that's specific to the recommendations that we've made. We get the response from management and we assess the reasonability of that. Um, particularly the not complete ones, we do very little with those because management's already said, no, we're not done. So this year we provided the, we asked management to provide their summaries, which are in appendix four. So for the, the complaints one, it's page 60 of our report. You can see what management has said. We read that, we make sure that it doesn't jump out at us as completely outlandish, and then we, we move on with that. So we're not in a position to provide any more information as to the, the impacts of that at this time. Ms. LeBlanc. And just on that, so forgive me for, <laughs> I always sort of get these timelines confused, but if this is a 2017 rec uh, report, then will you look at, you'll look at that one more time uh, as a follow-up, is that correct? Mr. Spicer? That's correct. Ms. LeBlanc. When will that be? Mr. Spicer. Can, yeah, uh, sorry, actually we'll be looking at it two more times under our new process. So, um, so we'll be starting that work uh, probably late this year for, for reporting in the, typically we report this in the spring. So each year a follow-up report's reported in the, you know, the February was pushed this year out to, to to May, so we'll start the work at the end of this year, report early next year. Ms. LeBlanc. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to move on to mental health services now. So based on the uh, May 2020 report, the NSHA has not completed three recommendations related to mental health. In 2017, the Auditor General recommended that the NSHA, one, finalize policies for emergency mental health services in collaboration with the IWK as required and reflect a provincial approach to service delivery, two, implement the emergency department safety recommendations identified in the January 2017 Improving Workplace Safety Report as accepted by the government, and three, ensure ending, sorry, ensure funding to, to programs and services is allocated based on service delivery plans and include accountability requirements for the performance of funded programs and services. By not completing these recommendations, there are risks that policies are inconsistent, identified emergency department safety issues may not be addressed, and funding to, pro to programs and services may not be based on service delivery plans. Uh, and these weaknesses were identified three years ago. Would you be concerned that the risks uh, your office identified may have been intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic? Mr. Spicer. So I, I think I would have to go back to, to a very similar response I, I would have provided to one of your previous uh, questions, and that was uh, if the recommendations are not complete, the risks associated with those recommendations exist and continue to exist. And, uh, and, and it's possible that they could be uh, e even more elevated dur during a pandemic, so. Ms. LeBlanc. Yeah, well certainly we have seen in many cases throughout the province the way the pandemic has shone a light on uh, the cracks in the system and uh, places where there's already risks and, and we know that vulnerable populations who are affected by these, uh, this lack of, um, uh, responsibility, as it were, uh, have suffered more greatly, for sure. So I agree with that. Um, 
more generally now, uh, based on your follow-up report, this follow-up report, would you recommend uh, the Public Accounts Committee call any of the departments, I mean, we've already talked about the, the, the Health and Wellness Department, uh, in particular to appear to discuss incomplete recommendations? Like when you think about all of the incomplete recommendations, do you think that there are certain ones that we should be calling for sure? Mr. Spicer? Well, if what I would do would be look at uh, 2016 as an example, there's there's a number of uh, of uh, audits there that the recommendation implementation is slower than than um, than other departments, and there may be very good reasons for that. So I would look at those, uh, and I think their species at risk, uh, Department of Health have a couple. Um, uh, those ones, I think you would you would uh, it would probably be a good idea to bring them in and, and try to understand uh, why those recommendations are still uh, outstanding and uh, and perhaps can respond better to some of your questions about well what what does that mean like what are, what are the what are the bigger risks associated with those things so um, so so I would if I was the committee I would I would look at some of those I think 2017 there's there's a couple as well um, that that um, you would look at and I don't have the, the list here but some of them that are that the recommendations are the percentages are, are a little bit lower I would I would think it would be wise to bring them in and and have a conversation about why that is Ms. LeBlanc. thanks how much time do I have you have six minutes okay Claudia I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get to you um, so the overall, you know, again, a general question, the overall completion rate for the recommendations is pretty good. Uh, we see 93% of the 2015 recommendations completed, 70% of the 2016, and 81% of the 2017 recommendations completed. Um, the, the province's Auditor General Performance Audit Policy states that the generally accepted time frame for completion of agreed upon Auditor General recommendations is two years. Government agreed to these recommendations and made a commitment to complete them. Like as we as we see when you bring up like a new report uh, and you know the government agrees to it. Are you satisfied with the rationale provided by the departments recommending the recommend or regarding the recommendations that have not been completed within the accepted time frame? Mr. Spicer. So uh, that is really a question for the audit, uh, the the public accounts committee, and any other oversight bodies that would be be looking at this. I mean, our, our I mean, it's not it's not the auditor general's role really to to uh, you know to to be saying you need to do this in six months or whatever. We use the two years as a general benchmark, so it just gives a sense of where things are. Uh, but we do recognize that certain recommendations, all, not all recommendations are the same. Not all of them require the same amount of effort and, and things that need to happen to get them done. So, so we do recognize that as well. So, so we use two years. I mean, it could be, you know, there could be valid reasons why something may take three years or even four years. Uh, however, I, I think as you go down that three, four years range, it becomes a little harder to understand why it takes that long. Um, so that would be my only comment about that. Is that I and again I think uh, I think you would need to explore that with with management quite closely as to why why is something taking four years to or five years to implement? Like what is it about it that that takes that long? So uh, and and then you can judge for yourselves whether you think that's a reasonable amount of time or not. Chris LeBlanc. Yeah, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about, uh, you know, the recommendations being accepted and that kind of thing. And then there's some that, you know, take five years or just, just sort of like fall by the wayside. And our percentage of, of completion is, you know, really good at 90%. But those other ones, like, is it, a, do you, I mean, in your experience, is it a conscious uh, decision by a department to be like, okay, we said... Uh, we get these things done. Actually, <clears throat> it's not possible in this in our mandate or in this you know whatever in in this year or these five years, and then some are just like they make a clear decision that they're not going to complete them. Does that happen very often, Mr. Spicer? So uh, actually, when we do our performance audits, we uh, we have a good conversation with management to whether they agree with the recommendations, do they plan to implement them, and and generally we like to get to put for them to put timelines in their responses. So, so. Um, so 90, you know, very high 90 percentage, 99 percent, 
th they agree with them and they believe they're needed. And uh, so, but some of the things that happen, and, they, and we have to be careful as the Auditor General's Office not to be speaking for management because that's that's not the role of the Auditor General's Office. However, um, again, I, I think it's it's only fair and reasonable that uh, certain things may happen in in a in a department. They they may completely reorganize, as an example, and and responsibilities that used to reside in one department have now been moved to another department. Well, I would think that those would be. Uh, those would be factors that one would need to look at when, when, if one was trying to assess whether two years is the right amount of time or three years is the right amount of time. So, so you need to. I think you need to take every recommendation on uh, specifically and, and speak to management about well, what was your plan and, and, and those types of things. Now, however, we do in the report. We there, there's certain things that that we think should be happening, like developing uh, implementation plans that will help move that process in a more logical and, and uh, way through the through it. So, uh, you know, if they have people re assigned responsibility, do they have a process internally to be, to be monitoring what is the implementation, what's the status of these things? All of those things are important steps that contribute to, to help getting these recommendations done as well, so. Mr. LeBlanc, two minutes. Well, my final question is, um, of the 27 recommendations that are not completed in, in this report, um, are there any that you would p point to as particularly concerning, like uh, just in terms of the impact that they would have on Nova Scotians for not being complete? Mr. Spicer? None I would point in particular. I mean, we, we think all of the recommendations are important, and I know we've, we've, we've said that before, but um, I mean, it's true. We, we do all of those audits. The audits that we select, we select them because they are important to Nova Scotians, and, and uh, so, so they're all particularly important. Now, um, although I think it would be, uh, you know, in the COVID-19 world that we're in right now, perhaps those that relate to long-term care facilities and home care facilities and uh, mental health, uh, maybe those get elevated in the in the environment that we're in now. So, um. okay, thank you. The uh, the time for the NDP caucus is up. Okay, so we'll go now for 20 minutes to the Liberal caucus. Ms. Lone Scroft. Thank you, and it's good to have you back. And congratulations on the shifts of your positions. Uh, and um, we wish um, the former. Auditor General Well in his new uh, position in BC. Um, I hope you bake as well as he does. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to talk about what I have, um, of course, I represent a, a constituency I call land and sea. I have a large forestry sector and I also have fishing in my my area. So I'm going to ask some questions on, um, I'm going to start with agriculture. And um, we, we've seen that a, a, an improvement in the managing of diseases in their fishery stock. And I'm just um, wanting, wanting to ask a few questions about that, uh, because we know a, a lot of aquaculture, if there's any opposition, it's usually over the health of the fish. So um, how did you, um, what did you find in the improvement of the long-term outlooks? of the fishery stocks and the, and the health. Mr. Spicer. Uh, I, I don't believe that we, we, can, we can speak to that specifically. Um, again, as, and to go back to Mr. Atherton, some of Mr. Atherton's comments, when, when we do this follow-up report, we are looking very specifically at, at the recommendation and whether, whether it was implemented or not. We wouldn't then typically look at well, what are the effects of that sort of thing? So, I mean, one of the things that we can say is that um, of the nine recommendations that we had for, for the, on the aquaculture audit, they were all completed. So that, that's very good. So the risks that were associated with those recommendations have been addressed, but uh, we can't comment on, on sort of the, the, the health, you know, the implications of, of that. Ms. Lonis Croft. Okay, I can understand that. Um, so when you do the audit, is it a sit down with members of the department and questions and answers? Are you reading their reports, obviously, and their, their timelines and goals and completion? 
Um, is, are there any on-site visits to um, facilities? Mr. Spicer? So, and, and I'll respond quickly, and Mr. Harding can probably give you a detail. It, uh, so, and you're referring to this, the, to the, to the follow-up part of it, not the, the original performance audit report, right? Okay. So, so it would depend on the recommendation, um, but it is possible that we would need to go on-site. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, sometimes if we need to look at implementation of something, well, sometimes you need to, to be physically on-site to, to understand that, in fact, it is being implemented in use. So it is, it is possible that, that we could be doing that. Sometimes we can do things, and, and again, in the, in the COVID world, we we did uh, we would do things mostly remotely now if we if at all possible. But um, I don't know, Adam. Do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Hardy? Yeah, uh, just to follow up on what Mr. Spicer has said. Yes, very much. We focus on the recommendations. So <clears throat> this, <clears throat> pardon me. This year for aquaculture. <clears throat> there was two recommendations that were not complete last year that were completed this year. Um, those recommendations were very much focused around the needs to monitor and establish appropriate reporting processes uh, when it comes to fish diseases and then also develop and implementing policies and procedures respecting the various aspects of fish health program. So around those two recommendations this year, we wouldn't have done any site visits uh, for these two when we were validating what the department had provided to us. Um, in this case, it's a lot focused on policies, process, that sort of thing. So in this case, we would be able to, to get evidence of what had taken place without doing a site visit. Ms. Lona's Croft. Thank you. Um, so much of that, is that self-reporting by um, companies and, and fishers? who have operations? Mr. Spicer? So, do uh, you mean related to the recommendations here? Because of... Ms. Lawrence Craft? A, lo a lot of compliance issues in, in aquaculture are, self -report, are, are expected to be self-reported. So, um, you know, there are people with watchful eyes who, who keep an eye on, on some of these, and there are regular visits. There are, there are compliance visits that are routinely done by the department, but um, much is self-reporting. So have you seen, a, an, an in, was part of that improvement more self-reporting um, by facilities that are practicing aquaculture? Mr. Spicer? So I, I would, I would venture to guess the answer to, it would be that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't know whether there was any self-reporting by, um, uh, again, our, our focus would have been on the recommendation and that response would have came from management and we would have done what we would have needed to do to convince ourselves that that, that, that was done. Um, but beyond where that information comes from is, is, I don't think, would have been part of the scope of what we would have done here. Ms. Lotus Croft. Okay, and I'm going to switch to forestry because um, uh, I'm going to talk about silver culture a little bit. And um, I'm curious as to what this, um, uh, that you saw increase, um, what you call effective silviculture. So I'm not quite sure what the standards are for effective silviculture. Is that one that the department holds or one that a standard that you use for this report? Mr. Spicer? Oh, Mr. Ather. In terms of that specific recommendation, that was actually complete as of October 2017. So for this year, we wouldn't have looked any further at it. Uh, in, ter in terms of effective silviculture, that wouldn't be something we would define. That would be the department has defined what that is, but we wouldn't have any new information on that. That was two years ago, two years ago's follow-up report that would have had, would have found that to be complete. Ms. Lewis Craft. Well, just that there's, the, it's such a hot topic right now. We had the, the um, premier closing, um, Northern Pulp and um, a lot going on with the transition team and uh, we have the Leahy report before us and the minister's round table. There's, you know, it seems to be such a hot topic, um, especially in my area and, you know, plus we have what's crown land and, and what is privately owned land, you know, for silviculture practices. So I was just a little curious as to um, if there were um, 
improvements found in you know one sector over the other but that's fine i'll pass it on to miss miller miss miller thank you i uh, just uh, actually only have one question there i mean there's a lot of topics that we could do but my colleagues all have have their questions that they'd want to ask but i just wonder how nova scotia compares uh, as a comparator to other provinces in in the completion of the recommendations of the Auditor General. Uh, do you have a standard or a comparison with other provinces and how do we compare? Mr. Spicer. So, so that's a question that we get asked a lot and, uh, and the answer unfortunately is um, it's extremely difficult to compare and the reason being uh, because each Auditor General's office kind of tackles this project perhaps a little bit differently and uses different time frames for when they look at things. So um, it's, we, we don't know how we compare to the prov other provinces, but I mean, I, I'm thinking that, you know, again, at a very high level, um, these rates that we're seeing here are 80% in two years, I think would be, you know, a, a, a a good goal for any any uh, province, and I think you know the the results seem to be with this 2016 had some had some problem areas, but that that area that goal seems to be probably what a lot of provinces would 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 determine to be fairly uh, um, you know a fairly uh, good one. Uh, but uh, we don't have a comparison to what other other provinces uh, implementation rates because. The, there's a lot of differences, so it's it's it may not be comparable. Ms. Miller, Mr. Jesse, thank you kindly, Mr. Chair. How much uh, time this round? Uh, there's 11 minutes. Excellent, thank you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into the subjects of uh, licensed childcare school capital planning and uh, home care. So uh, firstly, I guess I'll start out with uh, the piece around home care. And, it, and, it, and, if, and if you can, uh, through the chair, um, can you, can you kind of talk a little bit about the benchmarks that you would have um, established to indicate that there were, there were gaps or a more desirable scenario with respect to um, the performance indicators that that are referenced in that part of the the report, please, Mr. Spicer. So, Adam, would you be able to uh, speak to the risks of that, Mr. Asher? So, I'm looking at this. I'm you're speaking to recommendation 3.2. Is that what? Just to make sure that I'm answering the right topic, Mr. Jessup. Yep. Yes, sir. Mr. Arthur. Okay. So some of the issues we found in the uh, the original audit, which again, we wouldn't have looked at, you know, when we're doing the follow-up, we don't find new information, but our original concerns were around no verification of hours billed by service providers uh, or confirmation whether the services have been delivered prior to issuing payments, no verification of reporting against key performance indicators and the st or the statistical information provided by the, the service providers. So what we found or what our concern there was that the providers could inaccurately report performance to avoid penalties and they may not calculate the statistical information in accordance with department standards. Um, we didn't specifically see that. What our concern was with how the department was, what the department was receiving and what they were doing with it. Mr. Jessup. Thank you. And, and, it, and as per the, the appendix for... Um, section of the the report here um, there is an indication that the department does in fact do do or there is some type of process established for reporting uh, I guess what's the what's the distinction uh, for you that uh, I guess considers this an inadequate uh, means to report Mr. Rather. So at the end of the day here, it, it, that actually isn't our distinction. The department indicates that they don't feel they are complete yet. Uh, so all of these conclusions are agreed to with the department, that this is what they've said, that they don't feel they are complete. Uh, their response indicates final completion anticipated in 2021. 
So it's not that we've looked at what they did and said, no, that's not good enough. They've said, here's what we've done, but we're not finished yet. Mr. Judge. Okay, thank you. And um, is, there, is there any indication of, I mean, it, it referenced here that, there, that there's a concern that there may be some type of misrepresentation of the facts, perhaps, that, um, that are submitted by organizations or companies that facilitate home care. Um, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on uh, what type of information comes in and, 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 and why you think that that particular, or why you think that that particular method of reporting is, is inadequate? Mr. Rather. Can't go a lot deeper than what I did to the first question. Our concern is, right, you know, if they're not verifying the hours billed, or that the services have even been delivered before payment is issued, um, and no verification of the statistics against key performance indicators. It's not. We didn't necessarily see anything that was specifically wrong. What we're looking at is a process that would allow either intentional or accidental mistakes to be made. Uh, our expectation is that the department should be overseeing these processes and should have steps in place to ensure that what's coming in is accurate and that they have confidence that what the service providers are indicating has been done, that it has been done, and that the people of Nova Scotia have received the services that they're supposed to be receiving. Mr. Justin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, these are this is a group of people that um, we need to spend specific time uh, looking after, and um, if we're not getting the information that we need to validate that care is being conducted appropriately, then um, as uh, I guess on our end, we need to um, develop De develop means to be sure that that, that care is, is happening in, in a top quality matter, manner. Excuse me. Um, moving to school capital planning, please. Uh, the, there appears to be an indication that there has been uh, a process developed. Uh, I believe there's a 2019 date referenced Yes, excuse me, the 2.2, the new process for long-term capital planning was approved on May 29th, 2019. Um, can, you, can you go into a little bit about, you know, again, where that benchmark was initially and where, where the, the OAG felt that there was a gap and I guess how, subsequently how that uh, new process uh, for all future capital planning uh, is is an improvement to the previous status quo. Mr. Atherton. I can start with a little bit of information about what we originally found. Um, there was a, a t tangible capital asset request template that school boards at the time were using, uh, but when we looked at it, there were many, many sections of it that weren't complete at all. Uh, there were a lot of gaps. Um, so our, our perspective on it was that there should be a standard approach used so that all school assessments are consistent, that the same information is being put forth, put in front of a committee to make the decision so that we can ensure it's an apples to apples assessment. As for the new process, because the department indicated that this was not complete at the time of, uh, as of October 2019, we will not have looked at that yet. Um, we will look at that, at that shortly, assuming that this time frame indicated here has been complied with. If they've met that and they have a new process in place, then in a, a month and change when we get the new download, if it says it has been completed, then we'll assess what they say. We'll be looking at the looking for support for that new process. But as of today, I'm not in a position to speak to what that process is. Mr. Justin, with about three minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Uh, I'll, I'll just shift gears before I run out of time. So on to licensed childcare, um, it appears that the, the focus is targeted at 
uh, home-based daycare operations, as, as, as I understand it, based on the information in the appendix here. Um, can you, again, go into kind of the, the, the benchmark and, uh, that, you, that you used to establish that there was a gap here and um, I guess the subsequent information around uh, improvements and expected timelines for those improvements? Mr. Hardy. <clears throat> so in terms of that recommendation, what we had originally found um, was that the department wasn't inspecting uh, approved family home daycare centers in accordance with departmental policy. Um, the department was really relying on licensed agencies to monitor approved family home daycares. Uh, but the uh, however, the policy that the department had indicated that the, the department would inspect at least 25% of home daycares under each agency every year, which at the time wasn't being done. Um, in terms of benchmarks or gaps, I can't really speak to it. Again, this would be a case where the department has assessed this recommendation is not complete. So they have said that the, as of October 18th, 2019, it is not complete. And they provided their summary of what they're doing or what they're working on. Um, but beyond that, I wouldn't be able to provide any comments. Mr. Jensen, a minute and a half. Okay. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's another element of that a uh, licensed child care piece has to do with, with, with grants um, in that uh, there's an indication that they're not being perhaps appropriately distributed. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Mr. Hardy? So there was two recommendations that really uh, dealt with grants. That was recommendation 1.7 and recommendation 1.8. A lot of the issues that led to those two recommendations were very similar. Um, the department was evaluating the early childhood enhancement grant and child care subsidy programs in 2016, and it determined at that time that, that the, uh, the program objectives weren't being met. Um, they had taken some steps to address those issues, but the department really was relying on self-reporting by child care centers uh, to distribute program funding. Therefore, there was a risk that uh, funding may not be based on, on actual eligibility. Um, there was some annual reviews of su subsidy clients were not, sorry, annual reviews of subsidy clients uh, also weren't being conducted as required by departmental policy at the time. And all that created a risk that grants may not be awarded based on actual eligibility and grant money may not be distributed according to actual need. Um, again, for these two recommendations, the department has assessed these two as not complete as of uh, October 18th, 2019, uh, and gave a bit of an indication in their summary of the work that they're doing. Um, they also provided some timelines, and I note that they had indicated that by August 2020, they were anticipating these two recommendations as being complete. Um, again, we wouldn't be able to speak to whether COVID may have had an impact on those timelines that they were originally anticipating, but we will be doing our follow-up again on this, this chapter. Um, as of next month, actually, we'll get the download, and at that time, we'll be able to see how they've self-assessed this recommendation. Thank you. The time allotted for the first round of questioning has expired. Uh, as mentioned earlier in the meeting, we'll now take a 15-minute break. And to remind it, have your masks on, you leave through the side exits, and you come in through the main door. So we will resume at 10.22.
Order, please. We'll call the meeting back to order and we'll uh, have the second round of questioning uh, to the Office of the Auditor General. This round will be 12 minutes for each caucus. We'll begin with the PC caucus, Mr. Hama. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to turn your attention to uh, November 2017 follow-up, managing home care support contracts. Uh, specifically, gentlemen, if we could look at page 60, uh, section 3.2, quote, the Department of Health and Wellness and the Nova Scotia Health Authority should put a process in place to verify the accuracy of reporting from home support providers. Reported hours, performance indicators, and statistical reporting should be included in the verification process, end quote. Um, I've, heard, I've heard from constituents over the years uh, with respect to uh, home care that that they're still charged the full hour uh, if some arrive late and uh, or if others uh, leave early. They're still charged regardless. So I'm curious, in the scope of your uh, audit and follow-up, has the Department of Health and Wellness and the Nova Scotia Health Authority, have they established a process to verify accuracy of reporting? Uh, what time they show up, what time you know, home care workers show up and leave uh, from the, the home support providers? Mr. Mr. Rather. So, as you can see here, this recommendation, the, the health and wellness has deemed as not complete. Um, so at this point, no, it does not appear that there is a process to verify the accuracy of the, the reporting from home support providers. As to specifically when someone arrives, when a support worker arrives or leaves a house, I can't speak to whether that was part of our initial concern. Uh, we were at a higher level than that. It was a bigger picture of, of just a, an, an overall verification of the information provided. So I don't have any information to get any further into whether, you know, looking at the down to the minutes of people spending time at, in a home, per, home care situation. Mr. Hong. Uh, as an MLA, one of the central complaints I hear about home care, um, and it's, it's not in your report, uh, it's how often client visits are cancelled because there's insufficient staffing uh, to provide care uh, for all prescribed visits. Obviously, I, I do understand you can only speak within the scope of the, the follow-up and the audit. Uh, I'm curious, though, within the scope of the follow-up, did, did that topic ever come up? Um, uh, the, you know, tracking the amount of cancellations uh, from home care uh, workers, continuing care workers with, with the clients. Mr. Rathford. No, that would not have come up during our follow-up process. We're just looking at the recommendations. So if we didn't have a recommendation specific to that, then we wouldn't have seen any information around it during our follow-up work. Mr. Hum. Would that be a topic the Office of Auditor General would be interested in, um, in uh, having a look at? Mr. Azard. I will never say no to whether I'm interested in considering a topic. Uh, there, there's an unending list of areas we can look at. I've got a, an ever-growing, it seems, always getting longer list of things we should consider at some point. Uh, so. I won't rule it out. Uh, no promises that it's happening imminently, but I'm always considering things, and that's certainly an area that we'll consider as we go forward. Mr. Huff. Uh, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, certainly, you know, I've, I've also heard, you know, great things about home care, uh, in all fairness, but I've also heard that this is, uh, from my constituents so over three years, that this is a, a common concern. So certainly I, I'd encourage you to, to add to that comprehensive list you have of, of areas of government sectors to, to investigate, to, to, to audit. Um, okay, page 60, uh, 3.5. Quote, the Department of Health and Wellness and the Nova Scotia Health Authority should maintain an integrated record of uh, complaints received, including their outcome. Um, end quote. Um, within the scope of your uh, follow up, do you know if the Department of Health and Wellness and the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, have they established a centralized database um, uh, for home support complaints? A centralized database. Mr. Rathard. 
as these recommendations are deemed not complete, we wouldn't have done extensive work or any work looking at what has happened to date. Uh, just looking at the responses on page 60, it would appear the health authority has established processes and databases separately, or they've indicated they have, but we haven't looked at that to see whether that's the case. Uh, there's no indication here that they have established a centralized database. Um, so the department and the health authority are indicating they haven't, but I can't speak to the veracity of that. Mr. Hub. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so with respect to um, home care providers that take on many more clients uh, than they can provide care for, I've certainly heard about that from, from some of my constituents. Um, in the scope of your uh, audit and follow-up, did you find out how often uh, clients or their family cancel visits? Did you come across data information on that? Mr. Atherton? No, again, if there wasn't a recommendation specific to it, we would not have been looking for that information. We wouldn't have asked for that information. We wouldn't have been provided with that information. So I, I can't say that I've seen anything through our follow-up process on that. Mr. Hull. Just segueing into that follow-up process, uh, Mr. Spicer, you indicated uh, two years is the benchmark. It is the benchmark by which you, you, uh, you uh, decide you know, to go back. How is it you arrived at that benchmark of two years? Is that sort of best practice among uh, various offices of Auditor General uh, throughout uh, Canada? Uh, what was the criteria at which you arrived at the two years as opposed to, say, you know, one year? Mr. Spicer. Yeah, it really was a judgment call on our part that, I mean, we, we I think we, we had to be reasonable that, that uh, uh, understanding that certain, all, not, all recommendations are not the same and certain ones will take a lot more time and certain ones will take less. We, we do uh, need to give management some time to react to the recommendations. So uh, we, we, you know, as an organization, we thought looking going back after two years would be a, an appropriate amount of time for, the, for the, the department to develop their plans and do what they need to do to get, get, the, uh, get the recommendations implemented. So it was really a judgment call on our part. Um, and I mean, we've, we've been doing performance audits for a long time, so, and we know the nature of the recommendations. So generally speaking, we felt that two years was a reasonable amount of time. Mr. Halbert. And is that considered best practice, or does it vary among offices of Auditor General. Like if I did a jurisdictional scan, what I discover in Saskatchewan, they, every year, a follow-up. Mr. Spicer. Yeah, it very much uh, is um, uh, different. Uh, different Auditor General's offices seem to have different approaches to this. Uh, some will do them uh, after a year. Some will, some will just simply do management uh, uh, responses and not do provide any assurance on those and we, we, we we're, we're in the middle of that process so uh, it really is all over the map uh, some offices do uh, will do a follow-up uh, only on uh, departments that they're currently auditing so they'd only do health as an example if they were happen to be doing an audit in the Department of Health so it, it is quite quite uh, quite varied in the approaches mr. Hum time uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. No, three minutes three minutes okay when you do a follow-up um, and again this is process when you do a follow-up do you usually request to speak with a, a specific position within a department uh, or does the department offer a list of positions that you can speak with about the inquiries that you're you're making I'm curious about the process of that mr. Harding so when departments self-assess the status of their recommendations, um, part of the information that they're providing to us is a key contact for the recommendations. Um, it varies depending on the organization and the nature of the recommendations. Sometimes it could be a more senior individual. Sometimes it might be someone who's a little, a little bit more junior in the organization. It really depends, though, very much on the nature of the recommendation. So if, um, if the recommendation was very specific and very action-oriented, they might be giving us the name of someone who can speak to the implementation at a more detailed level than 
uh, someone at a more senior level within that same organization. Conversely, if it's a, a recommendation that's very broad in scope, they might provide us, at least initially, the name of a, a more senior individual to start with. And from there, as we learn more about the recommendation or as we are, are seeking our information that we need, uh, we would contact whatever staff within the organizations that we need to. So. Uh, those names within that system, it really is a starting point, but it's not where we stop. We would certainly seek out anyone that we felt we needed to speak with to obtain the, the information that we need. Mr. Hobbin, two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And how far can you go with that when you're seeking out that key position uh, to speak with within, within a department to uh, be able to, to extrapolate the, the, the critical information? Uh, does the Office of Auditor General have the power to, um, I guess, compel a certain position within a department uh, to, to speak on a topic? Mr. Spicer. Yeah, really, the the Auditor General's Act is is uh, you know is is fairly fairly powerful in that way, in that um, you know we we have the authority to speak to whomever we believe we need to speak to, uh, and to see whatever information we believe we need to to look at. So, um, so as as Mr. Harding said, we um, you know if if we don't feel we have the evidence and information that we need from a particular person, we will. Follow the follow the, the the chain till we get to the to the proper proper person. Mr. Alman, with the 45 seconds. And have you encountered a resistance? Um, you may say you submit a position. Say, look, I want this individual in this role to speak on this. Have you, uh, in the course of your your time with Office of Auditor General, have you uh, uh, encountered resistance to the the key positions you want to speak with? Mr. Spicer. I would say overall the uh, no. We, uh, I mean, I, I, we get very good cooperation from uh, from the entities that we audit. Um, we've got a very good working relationship with with them all, and uh, and it's important we maintain that, and we do. But uh, we uh, we don't have any problem getting the information we need. Thank you. The time for the PC caucus has expired. Uh, to the ADP caucus for 12 minutes, Ms. Tender. Thank you uh, and welcome gentlemen. Um, I want to ask a question about the recommendations related to responsible gambling prevention and treatment of problem gambling. Uh, in 2015, and I believe earlier Mr. Spicer was talking about some of these uh, stale dated recommendations, um, <clears throat> and I believe this, uh, this would form um, one of those. Uh, the Department of Health and Wellness established goals to determine if gambling prevention and treatment efforts are effectively reducing the number of Nova Scotians experiencing gambling harms and to evaluate progress on an annual basis. These recommendations were recorded as not complete in the May 2020 follow-up report. The department indicated that there would be a report including baseline data produced in May of 2020. Do you know if this report was produced? Mr. Spicer? No, we, we, we don't. We haven't followed further to, to look at that. Ms. Tinder. Thank you. Well, we look forward to finding that out at the appropriate time. Um, but just to probe a little bit further into this particular area, our caucus uh, has had concerns about how gaming is managed for quite a while now. Um, an FOI that we received shows that the government's decision uh, in 2014 to abandon the My Play program, which was essentially a responsible gambling program where players had a card uh, that collected data and that prompted them, um, was due to a significant drop in revenue. So they abandoned the program because they weren't making as much money, which presumably would have been a foreseeable result of people gambling more responsibly. Um, in emails to the finance minister, a government staff member admitted that the My Play system was acting as a disincentive to people using VLTs. Again, ideally part of the goal of the project. If people are using VLTs in an irresponsible manner, this program was designed, in fact, to show them uh, that they didn't need to do that. Uh, revenues uh, by VLTs increased by $10 million in the years following the uh, elimination of MyPlay in the year. Um, and we know that that program had its flaws and people would use multiple cards. Um, but when it was removed, it was not at all replaced. 
And so my question is, if your office found in 2015 that the department didn't have goals to determine if gambling prevention and treatment efforts were effective, period, which is how I read the report, do you have any insight into how the decision could have been made based on your review and, and your analysis to cancel the MyPlay program? Mr. Spicer? Do you have any knowledge? Uh, no, we, we, we don't. And I don't believe that. Uh, we certainly wouldn't look at that as part of the follow-up because, we, again, we, we would focus on the recommendations here. And, um, and to my knowledge, I don't believe that was part of the original scope of the performance audit or if that happened after that time frame. So, so sorry, I don't have, a, don't have a lot of information on that. Ms. Tender. Okay, well, I'll just come back at it one other way, and if, if it's not in the scope, then we can move along. But I guess the question is, you know, from the perspective of an auditor, if there are not goals in place in a department to track something in this case, to track any kind of metric, but in this case, the metric would be prevention and treatment efforts um, by the, for gaming specifically, um, would you say that without such metrics in place that there is sufficient information to discontinue a program or to? Mr. Spicer. I would say that's a risk. I um, mean, you know, I think you would have to look at the specific program to understand what information you need, but there's definitely a risk. Ms. Chender. Thank you. Um, so I want to move now to uh, critical infrastructure resiliency. Uh, in the May report, you indicated that the Emergency Management Office has not completed a 2016 recommendation to ensure all critical infrastructure owned by the province is identified and has, document, has documented all hazard risk assessments. Uh, the risk of not completing this is that the government may not be prepared to respond to events impacting its critical infrastructure. Uh, the EMO, the Emergency Management Office, uh, response to that uh, stated that the, a matrix was being developed and would be considered as part of the province's critical infrastructure strategy. Uh, the timeline for that completion, I believe, was fall 2019. Can you advise if that was, in fact, completed? Mr. Hardy. Um, this would be another recommendation where the timing of this project comes into play. Um, so again, departments would be undertaking their own internal process to review their own status and then update the system that we ultimately get uh, the recommendation status from. So in this case, at some point prior to our download, which was October uh, 18, 2019, they would have populated their summary within that system. So at that point, they were anticipating fall of 2019, um, but ultimately they said that the recommendation at that point wasn't complete. So we wouldn't have done any work past that date to verify whether that matrix had been developed in accordance with their timeline uh, around this recommendation. Ms. Tender. Thanks. So just to clarify, the time of your download was? Mr. Harding. For this for this follow-up report, our download was October 18th, 2019. So prior to that, departments would be populating that information in the system. Ms. Chender. So it might be reasonable to assume that if you had alerted the department to the date of the download, which you, I think, said earlier that you do, and that the date of com expected completion was fall 2019, that it is unlikely that the date of fall 2019 was met. Is that fair to say, given that the download was in the beginning of October? Mr. Spicer. Um, I, I don't think that would be fair for us to say, because again, the, the way we do this is we have to cut off at a t period in time, right? So, so we look at it as of October 18th, it was a done or not done. If it's not done, uh, management then provides their response as to, uh, you know, what they plan to do with it. So um, it wouldn't be fair for us, or nor could we say that, well, because it was a short time period between October and maybe November, uh, that means it wasn't done. And, and keeping in mind that there's now been almost a year elapsed from that time frame, so, you know, it's very well could be done. And, and again, that would be a great question for management to, to respond to. Ms. Gender. 
Thank you, uh, and we will look forward to following up on that. And I guess another more specific question um, on that audit is um, acknowledging that, that our current situation was not contemplated uh, at the time of this audit, um, or by anyone ever, probably, pretty much until it happened. Well except for a few super smart people. Um, would, at, would an all hazards risk assessment, which is being looked at here, include looking at the capacity for critical infrastructure to respond to pressures created by something like a global pandemic? Would that be part of, of this all hazards risk assessment uh, that was being looked at in this audit? Mr. Atherton. I can't speak nearly as eloquently or deeply as the, the, the folks from the Department of MEMO could speak, but the, I do understand from some previous audits that I worked on that all, that is the concept with all hazards, that it does address all hazards, that it should look at it. Um, I know when we did work on the pandemic preparedness quite a while ago, that that was a term that I heard a lot was all hazards planning and that that's what they were working towards. As to the depth that that planning goes, I, you're getting beyond my ability to speak, so you'd have to talk to the department for that. Ms. Chandra with uh, about three minutes left. Thank you. Um, well, certainly the folks at EMO have done a great job, and um, so, you know, I think uh, it's helpful to understand that that this probably was a part of it, and, and I think we look forward to, to kind of probing the status of that matrix just for our own understanding of, of how that work unfolds. Um, I want to move to climate change management. So environment, the Department of Environment has not completed a recommendation to regularly review its rating of climate change risks uh, to determine if those ratings have changed and to identify any new actions required to address the changes. Uh, by not completing this recommendation, there's a risk, of course, that environment is not considering whether changes to risk ratings are needed that may result in certain areas needing more attention. Um, I mean, there's so much to be said about this, but, but I think it's uh, clear from the title we use, climate change, um, that, that we are anticipating a shifting risk with climate change. Uh, so there's lots of modeling, but as with my question about the pandemic, I don't think most of us policymakers and elected officials understand the exact shapes that these things will take. Um, I think we've seen more severe storms. I think we've seen a change in weather patterns uh, that I think it's safe to say that most of us have not predicted even in the last few years. Um, the department indicated in a response that they were seeking funding from the federal government to conduct this work. And I'm wondering if your office has received any update on this work. Mr. Spicer. So uh, that would be a similar situation to, to the others. I mean, once it's, one, once it's past the October date, um, we don't do any work on it to, to verify what's happened subsequent to that. So um, when, you bring the, uh, when you bring management in, I'm sure they'll enlighten you on it. Ms. Tender, uh, 45 seconds. Uh, and so just to clarify, is it your understanding that the department has not reviewed its rating of climate change risks in the past three years? Mr. Spicer. Um, well, and, and Andrew or, or Adam, perhaps would be, maybe Adam would be better to, to respond to Mr. that. Mr. Hardy. Uh, in terms of the, the recommendation, ultimately the department is assessing that the recommendation is not complete. So based on their assessment that it's not complete, uh, I would infer that they haven't done that uh, review. Otherwise, I presume they would have said that the recommendation was complete and we would have then looked at what they had done. Thank you. The time for the NDP caucus has expired. Now we'll allow 12 minutes for the Liberal caucus. Ms. De Costanzo. Thank you. And um, my first question actually is regarding universities and the, um, the report um, is 4.2 uh, 
And I just wanted to understand how did you deal with the uh, different universities who received different amount of funding from government, and what was your base or, or your, your goal, um, the mutual goal for all the universities, and how did you work with them in order to come up with that report? Mr. Atherton. Um, you're going back quite a bit for us. This recommendation was complete as of 2017, so we haven't looked at it in any way, shape, or form the last two years at all. Um, I wasn't part of the original audit, and I don't have a lot of information from the original audit with me, so I really can't provide any further information on that. We wouldn't have looked at it for the purpose that we're here today. We, we wouldn't have looked at that recommendation at all. Mr. Spicer. Maybe I can just, just add a little bit to that. The, the focus of, of the audit at the time, though, was, was on how the department funds universities. So it was really about how do you determine how much a university should get? How do you determine how much, uh, you know, uh, monitor how they, they t what they use that money for to the extent that, that they need to? So it was really purely a, on a, a focus on a departmental funding program. It wasn't it wasn't looking at the universities themselves. Mr. Costanza. So that I understand that you weren't meeting with any of the universities themselves. You were just doing it with the department uh, based on the amount that they get. And, and they all, you gave them recommendations and they've all been, all universities have reached um, the, the right amount of um, efficiency and, and financial. Um, they give you enough reports or I, I, you know, I just wanted to understand how, and I'm really looking at it as um, has this helped them in dealing with what's, what is coming with COVID and the lack of um, uh, you know, funding they're going to receive from the students, because they, a lot of them depend on international students as well. So have they, what recommendations were there, and how is the government going to help them with the um, with that part of financial, they're going to lose a lot of money. And was that part of the um, report that you prepared, Mr. Spicer? So, so that specifically wouldn't been wouldn't have been part of the report. I, I mean, we would have talked to universities in our, um, uh, you know, in our scoping exercise to understand, you know, what the universities, uh, what process they do, how they, you know, how they see what issues they find with the university funding model and stuff like that, right? So. So we would have looked at, we would talk to universities in that sense. So, and, and then again, the focus would have been on the department and, and how, they, how they distribute the money. So, um, and, and I would have to go back into the details of the audit, which was a few years ago, to provide any more detail on that. But that's, that's really my understanding of how it worked. Mr. Costanzo. I'm just wondering if that will um, require another audit after, or would that be... Um something that you need to follow. I'm, I'm concerned about the universities and their, uh, and the amount of funding they receive compared to, uh, you know, it was based on certain number of students that they received and uh, how that will work in the future. So um, the other question I had actually was regarding the, the gambling that my colleague started as well. Um, do, did we see as part of your reporting, there was a, a, re a reduction in the number of youth who were getting engaged in, in, in gambling. Was that one of the items on your report? Mr. Harding. Again, very much for, that uh, for this report, um, we're very much focused on the recommendations. So there wasn't a specific recommendation related specifically to youth. Um, so for the purposes of follow-up, I wouldn't be able to speak to whether there was a reduction or anything to that regard. Um, I'm also not familiar with the details of that original audit. It was from 2015, so it was a, a few years ago. Uh, but I don't believe that spe uh, specifically was part of the scope of that work that we did. Mr. Costanzo. I had two items that I want specifically is the First Nation and the youth. So I guess the answer for the First Nation will be very similar. Um, sorry. Mr. Hardy. Um, all right. Yes, again, very much for this report. Um, our focus is on the recommendations. So we'd be able to 
say that the uh, the recommendation about negotiations um, with First Nation bands that it's not complete, but in terms of what they what the Office of Aboriginal Affairs is doing in regards to that recommendation and the work that they've undertaken, uh, we're not in a position to provide any comment beyond what they've already uh, what we provided in our report for their summary. Mr. Costanzo. The last question I have was also for recommendation 1.1. The Department of Health and Wellness uh, uh, should have management information system to efficiently, efficiently manage its responsibilities for licensing, inspection of, ho uh, of, uh, of homes for special care. Um, if you can maybe uh, outline on that one and how did you come up with the investigation that you did? Mr. Hardy. Uh, so around recommendation 1.1 for homes for special care, uh, in the original audit, what we had found was that the department was not using Amanda, it's an information system amongst other functions that it has, uh, or an alternative system, uh, an alternative database application. Staff primarily were using spreadsheets to track the stages of licensing and inspection processes. Um, all that really created a risk of inaccurate or inconsistent information for management reporting. Um, this year that recommendation was assess assessed as complete, so we would have done some work around that. And at a very high level, um, the department, our understanding is they've adopted the Amanda system. Um, they use that and the processes within it to automate business processes, including license renewals, complaints, and inspections. So they're using an existing system to be able to manage their responsibilities. That system is also um, generated, uh, generates reporting as well. So as part of our work, we would have looked to see Again, we're validating the reasonability of what we're being told. So we're looking to see um, evidence that the system is being used, evidence of reports coming out of the system and that sort of thing. Mr. Costanzo. And I think that's also very timely with now after COVID that this was completed ahead of time, which was wonderful. Thank you again. And I move it to my colleague, Mr. Jessup. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Costanzo. And through the chair, I, I'm going to uh, jump back. I, I kind of scurried on to uh, licensed child here from school capital planning, and I did have one um, element that I, or one question that I did did not get a chance to ask last round. So um, I would like uh, for through the chair for uh, the offices, the auditor general, to provide any information related to. I guess the content of, I guess the evaluations that that were in place or um, related to school capital planning, um, things that you might have noted were considerations like uh, school population, school projections, geographic area, age of the school. Like, can you can you comment on those types of qualifiers that? would go into uh, what was the existing uh, process and, and uh, how it's evolved since then. Mr. Atherton. I don't have a ton of information with me on that. Uh, the, the items that you talked to in terms of school population and whatnot, that, those were considered, uh, as we've noted, the, the template that was used often had incomplete sections. So while it may have asked for information on condition or on school population, it wasn't, there were inconsistencies, there were gaps in what was provided. Um, if we look at recommendation 2.1, should work with school boards to have a coordinated, comprehensive long-term capital plan for schools. That's improved. There, at the time, there was little information on general condition of all schools. There's now a five-year school capital plan. Uh, in terms of the, the new approach that is supposed to have been in place as of May 2019, we haven't looked at that yet. Uh, we'll be looking at that shortly, and we'll, assuming that the department has determined it's complete and has it in place, then we'll be looking at it and be able to speak to you or provide a report to you early mid-2021. Mr. Jessen, two minutes left. Two minutes, okay. Um, was there any element of, I guess, um, I guess requests from community involved in, I guess, the, the school capital planning process that you could, could note? Just, I know that 
you know, I, I represent a community that's um, the challenge has been challenged to deal with the enrollment in the area for since before I was going to the schools. And I'm just wondering if there's any element of consideration that you would note related to a community uh, supporting uh, the decision for uh, capital projects in, in their community. Mr. Hatherton. That wasn't an area that we specifically got into. Our, our focus was more on the, the tangible, the, the issues with the schools, the issues with school population. I, I would presume that there are many phone calls to school board members at the time we were doing the work. Now, presumably, many of those end up with, at the, the RCE or with the elected members, but that isn't something that we specifically got into or tried to quantify in any way. Mr. Jensen, if you can get it in 45 seconds. I, I, it, it's often noted that, that schools are built based on current population rather than projected. Um, did you come across that in your findings at all? Mr. Hazard. We wouldn't have seen it at this time, and I don't recall specifically from when we did the audit whether there was anything related to that. It wouldn't have been part of this follow-up process, so I'm afraid I don't have any more to share with you. Sorry. Thank you. The uh, time for questioning has expired. It was a very interesting, a lot of territory covered in that whole conversation this morning. So uh, again, we want to thank everybody for their participation and we invite the witnesses if they want to make any closing remarks, they can do so now. So ju just very quickly, uh, again, thank you for, for the interest in our work. And um, uh, as, the, as the chair had mentioned, um, this is a this is a, um, a very uh, uh, difficult audit for for us to to get prepared for because there's 160 recommendations, many of which would have been worked on four and five years ago. So um, so there was a lot of very good questions today and and very important questions and and because of the scope and nature of what we're trying to do here, we're not able to answer a lot of those questions. So. Um, so I would encourage you uh, to, uh, to, to bring management in and, and have those questions responded to. So again, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So now that we've finished the round of questioning, we'll move on to some committee business, okay? And the first is the correspondence, and I think everybody has been provided this electronically, but I'll... I'll just go through all the correspondence that can come through. Nova Scotia Health Authority requests to postpone the April 8th appearance, date of March 16, 2020. Office of the Auditor General, 2014 to 2019 calendar year reports, summary of chapters and whether audit organizations or witnesses at PAC on that audit. Nova Scotia Health Authority requests to postpone May 13th, 2020 appearance dated April 16th. Susan LeBlanc and Lisa Roberts, letter to the chair dated April 24th, 2020, request to meet immediately upon the release of the Auditor General's follow-up. Uh, the chair response dated April 27th, 2020. Honorable Kevin Murphy, response to the chair's correspondence inquiring how meetings could be held safely in accordance with public health directives dated May 5th, 2020 and the chair's letter was included with that. Uh, Susan LeBlanc and Lisa Roberts, letter to the chair, dated May 20th, 2020, asking for the rationale regarding the option that unanimous consent of the committee is required in order to call a virtual meeting. The chair's response dated May 25th, 2020. Susan LeBlanc and Lisa Roberts, letter to the chair, dated June 2nd, 2020, Request to have PAC reconvened. Chair response dated June 4th, 2020. Office of the Auditor General, 2019-20 Performance Report and 2020-21 Business Plan for the Office of the Auditor General. Tim Hallman, letter to the Chair dated June 12th, 2020, requesting that a meeting be scheduled in accordance with public health protocols the Chair's response dated June 29th, 2020. Honorable Kevin Murphy, response to the Chair's letter inquiring when in-person meetings may be able to be held dated August 10th. 
and that letter was included. Susan LeBlanc and Lisa Roberts, letter to the chair dated August 28th, requesting that PAC be reconvened. So as you can see, there was still lots of correspondence going back and forth, even though we weren't meeting, and the good thing is, here we are. So the next is the uh, subcommittee, uh, the record of decision for the subcommittee. The subcommittee met via teleconference on May 13th and reviewed the follow-up report of the Auditor General. And the record of the decision has been provided to the members, and I would request a motion to approve that record of decision. Mr. Jessup. Do we have so moved. Do we have a seconder? Ms. Tinkett Stanzo. Okay, do we have a mover and seconder? All those in favor? Terry can say by saying aye. Can't remind it. Motion is carried. Uh, the next item is uh, Lisa Roberts, uh, consideration for additional meeting with the AG concerning the follow-up report. It was discussed at the March 11th meeting, and this is more of a housekeeping item, just being brought forward as was left outstanding from the last meeting of the committee in March. So, I guess what we'll do now is look at the date of our next meeting, believe it or not. And the next meeting will be October 14th, 2020, in the chamber, uh, and in-camera briefing at 8.30 to 9, and I'll be here for that one. <laughs> uh, and from 9 to 11, the committee will meet, and the uh, topic and witnesses will be determined. Ms. Ms. Chender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, make a motion for the consideration of the committee. Um, this motion is being brought out of an abundance of caution, but also having just read through the reams of correspondence, all of which pointed to a single and specific matter, which was uh, the ability of the uh, standing committee that we currently sit in to meet over the past six months. Um, it's obviously something that is necessary, uh, despite the efforts of opposition parties um, to call a meeting of this committee over the past several months. The absence of clarity in the rules of the House of Assembly as to virtual meetings meant that we could not meet. Uh, the Liberal members of this committee were not willing to grant that consent. As House Leader, I attempted to discuss this with the Speaker, um, but the response that I received was similar to the one that we have in the package of correspondence in front of us, which was that, and I'll quote from his letter of August 10th, 2020, as you are aware, legislative committees make their own decisions as to when, where, and how they will meet. It's worth noting that all other provinces in Canada were able to safely convene during the pandemic, enabling elected members to engage in their legislative work. There is no reason, uh, as far as I can tell, why this was not able to occur here in Nova Scotia. We could have met virtually. Um, any suggestion that either public accounts or health, our two main standing committees, don't normally meet over the summer, which was a line that I heard regularly, is false. In fact, uh, within the last couple of years, since the advent of the Health Committee, these uh, committees do, in fact, meet during the summer regularly. Um, we recognize that it is preferred that standing committee meetings uh, be conducted with all members physically present. However, committees may wish to sit from time to time in virtual proceedings in circumstances where there's a global pandemic or travel restrictions, health vulnerability, or other physical distancing requirements or other completely unforeseen things, and I will rule nothing out in this year 2020 um, could befall us. Committees are free to organize their proceedings as they see fit, provided that they comply with the orders and instructions issued by the House. In cases where the House rules do not prescribe anything specific and they do not contemplate virtual meetings, committees may adopt procedural rules to govern their proceedings. Therefore, I would like to make the following motion. I move that where it is not possible for the Public Accounts Committee to meet in person, Due to public health order or other pressing reason, the committee will meet virtually according to its predetermined schedule in a manner to be determined by the chair in consultation with the clerk. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that motion? 
Mr. Hum. Uh, discussion on the motion. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. And, and certainly I, I, I can gather what the, uh, the honorable member is saying about uh, meeting, but I haven't seen any proof of anything of other provinces all meeting on their committees. Now I know that the HR committee meet, does meet uh, all summer, but traditionally other committees have been uh, dismissed. Uh, no. Yeah, and uh, but anyway, I'd like to see what the uh, information is from other provinces, and if they do meet during the uh, during the summer months. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hub. Uh, I want to thank the uh, the member for Dartmouth South for bringing forward uh, this motion. It, I believe, captures um, what's so critical, uh, what we need to address. Um, the certainly. Um, the, the, the example that comes to my mind right away is committees uh, of the federal government in Ottawa met uh, during this uh, uh, first wave. Uh, obviously, um, as a legislature, as a committee, we need to adapt to the, the circumstances in which we find ourselves in. And, uh, and, and most, certainly, most certainly, we need to make sure that uh, uh, questions are asked to government. And, and Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to put a, a motion forward to, to uh, extend the time of, uh, of public accounts so we can have a discussion, a further discussion on this. So we have a motion over ruling another motion at this point. So the question is extending the time for the Pardon me? Yeah. The motion is to extend the time, and we do have to know how long we're going to extend. As it's scheduled now, we're going till 11.15. So. Mr. Hammond. Mr. Chair, yes, let's extend the, the time of public accounts to 11.30. 11.30. Okay, we have that uh, motion on the floor. All those in favor shall you consent by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded? The motion is defeated. So, back to the uh, motion on the table. Uh, any further comments or discussion? Uh, Ms. Chandler. Well, I would just like to respond um, to some of the comments of my colleague, um, uh, Ms. Miller, uh, and, uh, and to say that um, we certainly could furnish proof of the meeting of other legislative committees across the country. Um, I found that proof on Google, um, but I am happy to send links to all of the other legislative assemblies and their meetings, including the federal parliament. Um, and when the Health Committee uh, came into being, which was around the time that this committee was effectively neutered um, and its meetings were reduced by less than half of their former amount, um, it was determined that both of those meetings would meet once per month throughout the year. So any suggestion that these meetings do not meet during the, that these committees do not normally meet during the summer is false. I will repeat that. I am aware that we have four and a half minutes left and I will ask my colleagues to consider please supporting the motion that says that if we can't meet in person, we meet virtually. And if my colleagues are intending to vote against this motion, I would like to hear without a suggestion that there isn't proof or without a suggestion that they don't normally meet during the summer, but a substantive reason why these meetings should not continue virtually if they can't happen in person. Further discussion? Ms. Miller. 
Yeah, thank you for those comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, the health committee is certainly very new and the intent always was to have meetings uh, for 12 meetings a year. Um, but the summer has been extraordinary. We've had COVID this summer and quite frankly, with the health department has been focusing all the resources on all the uh, information that was required to provide to Nova Scotians, all the services required. And certainly this was an exceptional thing. Uh, getting involved as the Auditor General's uh, department knows, <coughs> excuse me, getting involved with this, these meetings uh, takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of preparation to make sure that they have all the information there. And certainly it wasn't appropriate this summer to have it. Uh, as per my information, public accounts until until last year did not meet, uh, at least from 2013 on, was not meeting through the summer. Last year was the first year that they had. You know, the intent was to have health committee meeting, but certainly with COVID it hasn't, uh, but they are resumed now. And I believe that, uh, you know, we can uh, hope that uh, we will be able to continue in the vein that we are and meet here in person. Uh, mm -hmm. The online was not available at uh, that time, not something that we wanted to pursue and uh, we'll con continue in this vein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Laval. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, say that, uh, yeah, we want to call the question, but I, before I call the question, I just want to say that uh, all of the reasons uh, or all of the comments given by the Liberal Party are not answers to the question that my colleague has asked. So let's call the question and we'd like to have a recorded vote, please. Okay. The question has been called. Mr. McGuire. No, I'm sorry. So just appreciate the concerns. I know that we did have some committees running during, pardon me? Uh, we did have the HR committee running during uh, the pandemic. Uh, there was some issues on and off uh, with doing that, uh, including uh, some people losing um, internet connection. There was some interference, uh, or sorry, no, and not internet connection, but their phones were dropping and things like that. I do appreciate that. Um, you know, this is this is very important, and and it it is uh, it is a different time. I think that uh, the public health and the Department of Health and all committees and all government, uh, whether it's the NDP, the Conservatives, or the Liberals, have adjusted as as well as we can to this, and uh, we'll continue to look for ways to uh, keep the public safe when it comes to um, um, COVID-19, and at the same time continue to keep governments moving forward. I know that. All three parties, and one of them, uh, one of the members here is uh, a member of uh, that's in discussion with the other two uh, party uh, house leaders on the way this is going to move forward. Uh, whether it's uh, in person, whether it's uh, you know limited capacity here in the house, uh, that individual would probably know a lot more than anyone else sitting here at the table. So uh, what I would say is. I hope that uh, we'll just continue to move these these uh, committees forward. Okay, thank you. The, the motion has been called for a vote and a recorded vote has been requested. So I'll ask the clerk if she could name the names up or. Recorded vote has been requested? It's a recorded vote. Okay. Um, Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Ms. Chender? Yes. Mr. Hallman? Yes. Uh, Ms. Suzanne Lonis Croft? No. Uh, Honorable Margaret Miller? No. Mr. Ben Jessam? No. Uh, Ms. Rafa de Costanzo? No. Mr. McGuire? No. Nope. Mr. Bain. The motion has been defeated. So that uh, concludes our business for this morning. Uh, if there is no further business at this point, uh, the meeting stands adjourned. And a reminder once again, exit through the side exits. And make sure you take everything. If you have paper, pens, or anything like that, uh, your water bottles, please take them. There's recycle bins next to the exits. And uh, the subcommittee will meet uh, very shortly. Thank you. Meetings adjourned.